Hello and welcome. My name is Lisa Heald and I will be facilitating today's webinar on COVID-19 policies and equity in COVID-19 response and recovery. This meeting is being recorded and will be available online at a later date. We will be answering questions that were submitted ahead of time during a facilitated question and answer session for both policy and equity. We will also be monitoring the Q&A chat box for additional questions. Due to our limited webinar time, we may not be able to answer every question. If you have additional questions, you can put them in the question box and we'll try to answer them at a future session. We also encourage you to reach out to your FEMA regional point of contact for additional information or with additional questions. Thank you, and I will now turn to Bambi Krause, National Tribe Tribal Affairs Advisor for a brief introduction. Bambi, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, as was stated, this is Bambi Krause. I'm the National Tribal Affairs Advisor based in FEMA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for joining us today. Today's national webinar is called Public Assistance, COVID-19 Policies and Equity in COVID-19 Response and Recovery. And our goal today is to, is to provide tribal nations with a deeper understanding of FEMA's public assistance policies and to answer tribal questions on such issues as eligibility. We have a detailed presentation to provide you, and for that reason, I'm keeping my opening comments very brief and introducing the next speaker, Ana Montero, Director of the Public Assistance Division. Ana? Thank you, Bambi. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Thank you for your continued effort in the face of this pandemic. And most importantly, thank you so much for your partnership and your shared commitment to helping our communities during this very difficult year and for ensuring that everyone has access to a COVID-19 vaccination. I don't have to tell you, this has been an unprecedented time in history. And together throughout the pandemic, we've all dealt with many difficulties in our communities, as well as in our personal lives. We've also seen firsthand how we come together to help each other. On the FEMA front, we've delivered public assistance at historic rates. FEMA has obligated more than 70 billion towards the COVID response. And of that number, more than 22 billion is in public assistance. As we lean into our efforts to support vaccinations and more people are becoming vaccinated, we are hopeful that collectively we're heading in the direction of overcoming the many challenges that we've faced over the past year. We realize that there is still so much more work to be done and we're committed to seeing it through together with all of you. Today, we're gonna to discuss FEMA's recently released policies. Our medical care policy version two, which was released in March, and the safe opening and operations policy, which we released on April 5th, as well as efforts to ensure the equitable delivery of assistance. The president's commitment to ensuring the equitable delivery of our services necessitates new approaches to our work. We understand that implementing these new approaches and change in a disaster response environment can be challenging, but we're gonna work hand in hand with our partners to ensure the maximum delivery of resources to our partners, including our tribal partners, and to ensure that we're reaching underserved and vulnerable communities. We will make best efforts today to answer all of your questions. We may not be able to answer all your questions today. However, we are committed to continuing to address your questions and ensuring a shared understanding of the compliance and the requirements we're gonna be walking through with you today. Your FEMA tribal liaisons and counterparts in your FEMA regional offices are also available to work with you through these questions and any specific circumstances or, or challenges you may be facing. 
Thank you again for joining us. And now I will turn it over to our facilitator, Lisa Hill. Thanks, Lana, and thanks, Bambi, both of you, for those opening remarks. Before we begin, I want to provide a brief overview of the agenda of today's webinar. We will begin with a COVID-19 policy overview, including a PA eligibility overview and presentations on safe opening and operations policy and medical care policy version two. After a short question and answer session on policy, we will move to equitable pandemic response and recovery requirements. We will hear a presentation on general equity provision and reporting requirements for vaccine administration, followed by a short question and answer session. I will now turn to KJ Rutherford and Sarah Mulligan from the Public Assistance Division to begin our COVID-19 policy review. KJ, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is KJ Rutherford. Uh, I am with the Public Assistance Regulations and Policy Branch. Um, and I will first be discussing some general eligibility considerations for public assistance. Uh, next slide, please. So generally, once a disaster is declared, uh, multiple layers of government work in partnership to administer our program. Um, so once a declaration is declared and public assistance has been authorized for those designated areas, uh, we work with the recipient primarily as the pass-through entity. A recipient is primarily a state government, but can also be a tribal government or a territorial government. Um, then underneath the recipient acting as the pass-through uh, entity are our sub-recipients, and those are applicants, which can include any of our eligible public assistance applicants uh, that have disaster impacts within those designated areas. And that includes any state, local, tribal, or or territorial governmental entity, uh, as well as certain private nonprofit organizations that own or operate a facility that provides an eligible service as defined in the Stafford Act, our regulations, and our policies. Uh, next slide, please. So generally, what the eligibility process is, it begins with applicant eligibility uh, as demonstrated in our visual here, which we refer to as the public assistance eligibility pyramid. It's a general guideline for how to we determine eligibility for applicants in public assistance. So we first determine applicant eligibility, regardless of anything else, we have to make sure that the applicant is eligible. And as, as discussed, uh, we base that on uh, whether or not the applicant is a public governmental entity or whether or not the applicant is a private nonprofit organization that owns or operates a facility that provides an eligible service. Now, this consideration is not uh, quite as relevant for governmental entities as it is for private nonprofit organizations. And as a matter of fact, that's a great opportunity for me to provide some clarity um, on some questions we've received recently. Uh, so for example, any facility that is that is owned and the legal responsibility of a tribal government, for example, would be an eligible public assistance applicant. And that includes uh, gaming facilities, casinos, and things like that, as long as they are owned and the legal responsibility of a tribal governmental entity. And so there was some confusion about that um, in a previous uh, webinar. And I just wanted to clarify that confusion really was tied to the fact that any private for-profit entity that is the legal responsible uh, owner or operator of that facility uh, would not be eligible for public assistance. And any private nonprofit organization that owns or operates any kind of recreational facility or gaming facility or anything like that would not be eligible uh, because that is not considered an eligible private nonprofit service. However, for governmental entities, uh, that consideration is not the same and so as long as the facility is owned by and the legal responsibility of a governmental entity it would be eligible under public assistance um, and so that sort of helps to clarify that issue as well as sort of clarify the distinction between how we determine eligibility uh, between governmental entities and private nonprofit entities. Um, once we have established applicant eligibility, uh, we look at facility eligibility. Again, as discussed, uh, for private nonprofit organizations, that really uh, comes down to whether or not 
the service being provided at that facility is eligible. Uh, and then again, for governmental entities, it really just comes down to whether or not that facility uh, did uh, imp was impacted one way or another by the declared event. Um, once we've established applicant and facility eligibility, then we look at the work eligibility. And really what the work eligibility comes down to is making sure that there is a nexus between the work that is being performed and the declared event. And so we need to make sure that the work that is being performed and the cost being claimed for that work are necessary as a direct result of the disaster or the declared event. Um, and then finally, we look at the costs that are being claimed related to that work uh, to determine if they're eligible. And that really comes down to whether or not the cost is reasonable uh, and necessary to perform the eligible work. Um, and reasonable cost evaluations really come down to a lot of factors that we won't get into today, um, but really that comes down to things like um, what the current market value would be or what, can, what construction rates are for that area and things like that can help us determine reasonable cost. And next slide, please. So again, this is another visualization to sort of uh, uh, demonstrate the distinction between determining eligibility of a governmental entity versus a private nonprofit organization. So again, um, the, pure, the eligibility pyramid we just discussed, you see on the right, um, is really uh, specific to government applicants as opposed to on the left, you see a variation of that eligibility pyramid that stresses the need to establish both that the nonprofit organization is eligible and acting as a tax exempt uh, nonprofit organization, but also that the associated facility for which they're claiming work and costs is providing a service that is eligible as defined in our program authorities. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, now I'm going to move a little further down our eligibility discussion into COVID-19 specific eligibility considerations uh, as it relates to public assistance program requirements. And next slide, please. Um, so a lot of this is not specific to COVID. Um, this is all consistent with public assistance program authorities and requirements that are already in place. And it's important to understand that Although we have developed policies specific for COVID-19, that doesn't necessarily supersede our other uh, pre-existing program requirements. And that is something that we would like to stress because we get a lot of questions about that because we have so many COVID specific policies. We get a lot of questions that really amount to questions about normal public assistance eligibility. And it's important to keep in mind that those standard uh, program requirements are still in place for COVID-19. And the COVID-19 policies just provide additional information and additional provisions that we would not normally have in our standard normal public assistance operation, but we have developed specifically to meet unique needs identified in COVID-19. Um, so as uh, discussed already, the work must be the legal responsibility of the applicant. So if the applicant is claiming any kind of work or associated costs under public assistance, um, it must be their legal responsibility to perform that work. Um, and so, you know, when we're talking about COVID-19, most, if not all of that work really comes down to what we refer to as emergency protective measures. And those are measures taken to protect life, public health and safety. Uh, generally, uh, private nonprofit organizations are not going to have that legal responsibility um, unless it's tied to work or services that they are performing within their eligible facility. Um, however, legally responsible governmental entities may enter into formal agreements or contracts with private organizations to conduct eligible work, and that includes private nonprofit organizations. Um, so for COVID-19 declarations as well, this is getting a little granular, um, but FEMA is waiving the primary use and primary ownership requirements for private nonprofit organizations. Um, what that means basically is that uh, to be eligible for public assistance, the facility in question for a private nonprofit organization, uh, that organization must own 50% or more of the facility and that organization must provide an eligible service that uh, within 50% or more of the physical space within that facility. That's what we mean by primary use and primary ownership. Uh, however, those considerations were waived for COVID-19. 
Um, and then finally, um, we get a lot of questions about uh, deadlines associated with the emergency work performed under COVID-19. There is not currently a deadline. Uh, regulatory deadlines for emergency work are typically six months from the date of declaration. Uh, however, COVID-19 and the needs of that event obviously have gone well beyond that six month time frame. So FEMA has extended the deadline for emergency work for COVID-19 only um, indefinitely. Uh, and uh, no later than 30 days out, FEMA will provide notification to all of our stakeholders for when we establish that deadline, but we have not done so yet as the needs of COVID-19 are still prevalent and ongoing. Next slide, please. Um, so additionally, when we talk about allowability of costs, uh, again, this is standard across all public assistance operations, um, but we get a lot of questions related to COVID-19 here, especially as it relates to medical billing and insurance requirements and things like that. And it's important to understand that, um, and this is not just a requirement under public assistance, these are requirements across all federal grants, um, and they come from uh, Title II, Part 200 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And really what we're talking about here, and you can read um, the bullets here for yourself about allowability of costs, what we're really talking about is that applicants should be following their normal practices, what they would normally do even if there was not a federal disaster declaration. And so if they would normally bill for certain services, they are required to continue to to follow those billing practices and any costs that would normally be covered under those billing processes would not be eligible for public assistance as they would be considered a duplication of benefits. Uh, however, any cost that is not covered by another funding source would be eligible under public assistance, assuming all other eligibility requirements are met, of course. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, so duplication of benefits, I talked about this a little bit. This is basically just that FEMA needs to make sure it does not provide funding for any cost for which funding has already been received or will be received. So for example, if an insurance claim is made and insurance proceeds are provided for that claim, FEMA cannot duplicate that benefit by providing public assistance funding for the same cost. Um, that's also true for other federal programs of assistance. Uh, for example, there's been quite a lot of supplemental appropriations provided under legislation for COVID-19, including the CARES Act and other legislation. Um, so funding available under those appropriations uh, are also considered other sources of funding. And so FEMA just needs to make sure that it is not providing funding for a cost that is already covered by another funding source. And we work very closely with our federal partners to make sure we're not duplicating benefits. And we work closely with each individual applicant to make sure that we're not duplicating those benefits. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, just so everyone's aware, the cost share for all COVID-19 declarations uh, has been increased from 75% to 100% federal cost share. That means there is no non-federal cost share associated with any uh, funding provided by public assistance for COVID-19. And any projects that were obligated prior to that change will be automatically updated with additional federal funding in order to cover 100% of eligible costs. And next slide. Um, and then finally, as mentioned, there are a number of other federal sources of funding for COVID-19. Um, and we get a lot of questions about when should an applicant come to FEMA for assistance or when should they uh, seek assistance through other uh, means. And really the best way we can um, frame this is to say really the applicant needs to look at all of the available funding options and determine which option works best to meet their needs. And so public assistance is not a, a first or last resort of funding. It is one of multiple sources of federal funding. Um, and we encourage applicants uh, to look at all of their options and determine which one best meets their needs. Now, in order to help uh, applicants make that decision, FEMA did develop a fact sheet uh, that is available on FEMA.gov on our public assistance COVID-19 policy page. Um, entitled uh, Public Assistance, uh, coordinate, I apologize, Coordination of Public Assistance Funding with Other uh, Federal Sources of Funding. And that fact sheet is, uh, in, is intended to help applicants determine the best funding option. Uh, FEMA also 
developed resource roadmaps, which are also available on FEMA.gov, specific for COVID-19, that talk about all the different various sources of federal funding available for COVID-19 uh, to help inform applicant decisions about what funding options to seek. Next slide, please. And so uh, with that, oh, I apologize. There's one last uh, caveat to cover. We do get a lot of questions about this. Uh, this is about the eligibility policy for COVID-19 that we released in September of 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So my colleague, Sarah Mulligan, is about to tell you about our uh, recently released safe opening and operations policy, uh, which does provide some additional uh, uh, eligibility and funding options uh, to support COVID-19 operations. Um, but those of you who are aware or those of you who may not be aware, um, in September we released a policy specific to articulating what is and is not eligible under public assistance for COVID-19. And the main purpose of that policy is to are, is to distinguish between what we consider disaster costs versus what would be we would consider day-to-day uh, -day operational costs. So public assistance does not have the authority to provide funding for normal day-to-day -day operations, even if those operational costs have increased because of the declared event. Those are considered increased operating costs and are typically not eligible under public assistance except in very limited circumstances. So there was a lot of confusion about that in COVID-19 declarations in the first few months of, uh, of the pandemic. And public assistance developed this policy to try to clarify that issue. Um, and basically what the policy does is specifically defines what types of work are eligible for public assistance funding and what types of associated costs are eligible when performing that work. So anything outside of that would not have been eligible under this policy. Uh, uh, however, some of what was specifically not eligible uh, according to this policy uh, it has been made eligible under the new safe opening and operations policy. So it's important to understand that this policy is still in effect and will continue to be in effect. So when, you, when you're when you talking about whether or not the policy applies to the claimed work and costs, you really have to look at what is it that's being claimed. If what is being claimed is the type of emergency work that is defined as eligible in this September policy, then we would follow this September policy to determine eligibility. However, if the work and costs claimed are more related to what is covered under the safe opening and operations policy, then that policy would apply. So there may be certain costs that are eligible under the safe opening and operations policy uh, that would not be eligible under the September policy. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not eligible for public assistance. It just means we need to make sure that we're applying the right policy. And at the time, this policy was important to clarify that PA cannot provide funding to support daily operations. However, as Sarah Mulligan uh, will explain more, in order to align with the president's memorandum on COVID-19 operations, in order to allow facilities to reopen and operate safely in a pandemic environment, we developed the safe opening and operations policy specific to that executive order so that public assistance funding can be used to help support um, uh, safe opening and operations in a pandemic environment. Uh, however, that does not supersede the September policy, which is still in effect. And that's a confusing policy point. We want to try to make sure that we clarify that issue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a chart that we uh, tried to develop. To, uh, this is a very high level sort of summary of what time frames uh, are applicable to which policies to try to help uh, our stakeholders understand the differences between the different periods of eligibility, uh, particularly since the safe opening and operations policy is only applicable uh, on or after January 21st of this year. Um, so this is this is a very high level summarized chart. Uh, it's just meant to try to help uh, better understand those differences in periods of eligibility. Um, but in, in the interest of time, unfortunately, I, I can't get into the details of this chart, but, but it is available uh, to try to help uh, understand those various periods of eligibility. Uh, next slide, please. And we will pass it over to my colleague, Sarah Mulligan, to talk about the safe opening and operations policy. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, KJ. Um, 
So as KJ said, the September policy is, is still a policy. It's still in an effect for everything that it applies to. And in uh, January, the president put out an executive order which added um, additional elements of eligibility. And so I think we look at this as very much additive to what KJ just covered. Um, so it, adding more eligibility, more activities that are now um, available for reimbursement under the public assistance program. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, on January 21st of this year, uh, the White House issued a um, uh, an executive order which extended uh, costs for reimbursement for um, for states, tribes, territorials, and local governments under um, various governmental uh, federal programs, including public or including uh, FEMA for public assistance. And so, um, between the time that that executive order was issued and April 5th. FEMA worked with um, work to develop what the guidelines of, of that policy would be and how how it would apply. And so this um, this particular policy and the work described in the executive order really speaks to costs that an applicant might incur for either opening a facility that had been uh, temporarily shut down because of COVID and then continuing those operational costs. So for facilities that have remained operational at, at any type of capacity, we would be funding kind of continued operations. And for facilities that have been shut down either in its entirety or partially kind of getting those facilities back up and running in a safe manner and then continuing the operations forward. Next slide, please. So a few things before we dive into the actual work being performed, we just kind of wanted to provide sort of the overall applicability of the policy. So the timeframe for this policy um, is, is bounded, the executive orders um, on January 21st and then a subsequent one on, on February 2nd really defined the period of eligibility that the White House was looking, was looking um, for. And so that's between January 21st uh, 2021 through September 30th, 2021. So the, any work um, or cost incurred before that time um, is not is not eligible. So we're just looking for work that was conducted uh, during the specific time period. Um, and as I said earlier, work that was uh, otherwise eligible remains eligible. Um, so we're just kind of adding to the suite of options or the suite of eligibility under COVID-19, not necessarily subtracting from it. And like the other COVID policies, the uh, FEMA is funding the entire uh, entire cost share, so that 100% of the federal cost share um, for measures included in this policy. Next slide, please. So here we get kind of to the the meat uh, and probably the uh, biggest area of interest for for folks kind of attending this webinar. We're looking at eligible costs. So we uh, FEMA can provide assistance to PA applicants. So that includes. Uh, um, uh, governmental, state, local, tribal, territorial governments, eligible, private nonprofits um, for measures that they take in order to safely open and then continuing and operating their facility. And so those would include purchase and distribution of PPE and cloth face coverings, cleaning and disinfection, COVID-19 testing, screening and temperature scanning, and the acquisition and installation of tempor temporary barriers, um, uh, also, things like signage, uh, wash your hands, you know, stand six feet away. I'm sure everyone's kind of seen those floor decals that might, you know, you might be in stores kind of showing what six feet is. So all those types of things that you would need, you know, in order to, to facilitate the operation of your facility, you know, number of people that are allowed in at a time, things of things of that nature um, that are kind of scattered throughout throughout the pandemic. Um, and the important thing here in terms of identifying what We're having a little bit of a sound is. issue uh, with Sarah. Sarah, if you can keep talking, hopefully it'll come back. It's eligible, you know, beyond looking beyond looking at these measures and kind of um, within the boundaries of these activities described here is really good. So to these, um, these measures. And then the uh, purchase and storage of PPE, a common All right, we're experiencing uh, uh, internet uh, latency. Hello, I'm back on. I don't know if you guys can hear 
smear or exactly um, when I cut out. Um, you may want to try to sh um, shut down your webcam and just um, speak, and maybe that'll take some of the bandwidth. KJ, is it possible for you to pick up um, where Sarah left off on the slide and then continue with um, the, your part of the presentation as well? Uh, certainly, I'd be happy to do that. I certainly don't want to step on Sarah's toes. She's uh, incredibly knowledgeable, um, uh, but given the uh, technical difficulties, I'd be happy to um, be uh, a second best replacement for Sarah. Uh, so just to very quickly sort of pick up where she left off, I will try to uh, quickly go over this slide and then we can move forward. And uh, Sarah, I apologize. Um, for this uh, audible, if you will. Um, so basically what we're talking about here is what I mentioned earlier about what we would normally consider operating costs as ineligible. However, because of the unique challenges we face under COVID-19, the president has authorized public assistance to provide funding uh, to support reopening and operations. And these, these are the measures that are consistent with the executive order, as well as additional measures that we have identified as necessary to support opening and, and safely operating in a pandemic environment. And so that includes the purchase and distribution of cloth face coverings, which uh, and PPE when necessary. Uh, we we make a distinction there because uh, cloth face coverings per the CDC uh, are effective um, at uh, helping to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. We don't necessarily need to have the you know medical grade N95 masks, which would be considered a personal protective equipment. Um, just the cloth face coverings uh, are a lot easier to get. Uh, a lot more cost effective and are, are ultimately just as effective in helping with transmission issues. So um, cleaning and, dis and disinfection, again, this is specific to COVID-19 uh, and, and really where how we determine appropriate measures for cleaning and disinfection is um, that it's done in accordance with CDC guidelines for COVID-19 disinfection. Uh, because a lot of facilities already have a budget for cleaning their facilities. And so what we're trying to do is provide supplemental assistance for costs incurred above that normal cleaning budget um, for disinfecting for COVID-19. Um, so COVID-19 testing, uh, which before was only eligible in a medical facility, uh, we have allowed that for screening purposes. Now, this is diagnostic testing in order to determine if someone has COVID-19 um, as opposed to things like antibody testing and things like that would not be eligible. But just standard diagnostic testing to determine if an individual has COVID-19 is eligible. Um, and then other screening measures, including, you know, things like just the questionnaires that people you know, so uh, are, you know, to ask if symptoms of COVID-19 are being experienced um, and then temperature scanning, uh, which also includes um, the cost of the equipment related to that. So the temperature scanners themselves as well. Um, and then acquisition and installation of temporary uh, physical barriers as well as signage to support social distancing is really the purpose of that provision. Um, and then any purchase and inventory management necessary to support any of those measures uh, is also eligible as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, well, that sets us up. So we were right at the tail end of Sarah's um, presentation. Uh, so um, this next section is really about, specifically about the updates to the medical care policy that was released on March 15th of this year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in May of 2020, uh, FEMA released a medical care policy specific to COVID-19, again, to address the unique needs of COVID-19 um, that our standard public assistance policies um, were uh, not adequate to address. And so we uh, kind of expanded on our normal public assistance eligibility for medical care in order to address the unique needs of COVID-19. Um, so what we what we did not include at that time uh, were provisions for vaccinations. And that is why the policy was updated in March of this year. It was to add provisions for uh, vaccinations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so again, so eligible PA applicants for the medical care policy is going to be any governmental entity 
um, which we've already uh, discussed uh, the eligibility of any governmental entity under public assistance, um, and then private nonprofit organizations that own or operate medical facilities really is what this comes down to because it's this is specific to medical care provided for COVID-19. Um, and of course, this policy is only applicable to COVID-19 declarations. And next slide. Um, so we'll just quickly go over what the uh, what the original policy covered, uh, which is still in effect, and then we'll talk about the vaccination amendments. Um, so in a primary medical care facility, um, that's going to be primarily any medical care and any costs related and necessary to provide that medical care for COVID-19 only. And so at a, what we mean by primary medical care facility is like a hospital or a clinic, uh, any, any facility that is a licensed medical care facility that would be the normal facility that would provide medical care even when there is not a disaster declaration. So that's what we mean by primary medical care facility. Um, and so at a primary medical care facility like a hospital, any medical costs that are not related to COVID-19 would be considered normal standard operating costs. So uh, there would be, so public assistance would not be eligible to provide support for that. Uh, however, uh, costs specific to COVID-19 would be eligible under public assistance. And that's what this policy uh, really gets into. Um, next slide, please. However, because of COVID-19, there are medical surge capacity issues that have arised. And now this is not always the case, but in some areas, um, there have been capacity issues at hospitals and other medical care facilities. And so in order to address those medical surge capacity issues, we have also allowed eligibility for temporary medical facilities. And what we mean by temporary medical facility is a facility that is leased or set up temporarily to provide medical care in order to address those medical surge needs. Uh, what we mean by expanded medical facility is if the primary care facility uh, is expanded to address those medical surge capacity needs. Um, and so in either event, the reason that temporary facility is necessary is because of COVID-19. Uh, therefore, any medical care provided at a temporary facility uh, is eligible even if it's non-COVID medical care. And the, the reason that difference exists between the temporary and the primary medical care facility uh, is because the reason the temporary medical care facility is needed is because COVID created medical surge capacity issues that needed to be addressed. And so that's where that distinction comes in. It's important to understand that uh, because we would not normally pay for non-disaster related medical care. However, if it's at a temporary facility, the reason those costs are being incurred by an applicant is because of COVID-19. And that is the nexus that we established to the declared event. So in addition to the medical care provided at that facility, um, also the additional costs to set up and operate that temporary facility would be eligible as well. And so that includes things like um, leasing the facility, um, certain wraparound services, mobilization and demobilization costs, um, and things like that would be eligible. Um, and then also that final bullet is just to, uh, we uh, allow what we call warm sites, uh, and what we mean by that is sometimes a temporary facility is set up to address a medical surge capacity need that then goes away. But then later, COVID, there was a spike in COVID cases and that temporary facility is needed again. Uh, and so in some cases, it's actually more cost effective to sort of mothball the temporary facility instead of completely demobilizing it, if that makes sense. And so very bare minimum cost to keep that temporary facility operational so that it can be remobilized very quickly to address new medical surge capacity needs. Um, that's what we mean by warm sites. So those costs would be eligible as well. Next slide. Um, so again, we updated this policy in March of this year in order to add provisions for vaccinations. Now, just because the policy came out in March, it actually is applicable all the way back to January 20th of 2020 when the pandemic began. Um, so uh, it just took us a while to make those amendments and get the policy out. Um, but any vaccination activities, for example, that may have taken place prior to the release of version two of the policy would still be eligible under this policy as it applies retroactively to the beginning of the pandemic, unlike the safe opening and operations policy. Uh, next slide, please. 
so vaccination eligible work, I'll quickly go through these, but again, this is gonna be pretty consistent with what we've already talked about with uh, eligible costs under uh, med for medical care for COVID-19. Any costs that are necessary to support the distribution and administration of vaccines is going to be eligible under public assistance. And that includes setting up community vaccination sites to augment vaccination efforts, uh, whether they be federally supported or, uh, or run by a state local tribal or territorial government um, any costs incurred by the applicant um, for uh, related to vaccine activities um, as described in this policy will be eligible um, so that includes also the facility support costs for those community vaccination sites um, much like the temporary facilities we just discussed <clears throat> including leasing space the utilities maintenance uh, and those types of security, as you see for temporary facilities only, um, but that's consistent with our temporary medical facility provisions as well. Um, any uh, PPE or other equipment and supplies necessary for the proper storage, handling, distribution, transportation, or administration of the vaccines is also eligible, as you can see there, including things like the, the freezers for vaccines that have to be kept at a certain temperature, uh, for any supplies, uh, medical supplies and sharps containers for proper medical waste and, and for protection of employees uh, handling and administering vaccines, uh, transportation support, including refrigerated trucks, again, to ensure that the vaccines remain at the proper temperature and th all those types of things are uh, eligible uh, under public assistance. Uh, next slide. Um, so additional staff too, and that's, uh, so staff, so labor hours, for example, um, associated with um, storing or handling or distributing or administering anything that falls under that umbrella for COVID-19 vaccines is eligible. Um, but again, this is must be consistent with public assistance policies, uh, which for emergency work only allow overtime expenses. Again, this goes back to whether or not the cost incurred is a normal cost that the applicant would incur or whether it's an additional cost being incurred because of the disaster. And so that's why it's important to understand that that our normal PA requirements are still in place. And so when we say staffing is eligible, and this isn't just for vaccinations, this is across the board, um, what we mean is overtime, because those are costs that would not normally have been incurred by the applicant if not for the declared event. Um, uh, additionally, we're allowing resources to support mobile vaccination units. So that's any, any cost of the equipment, supplies, or the staff in order to set up mobile units that can reach remote areas or reach, in, reach individuals that otherwise would not be able to get to a vaccination site. Uh, we are also allowing transportation assistance to, to get individuals to and from vaccination sites. Um, but again, this is only for individuals with limited mobility. And what we mean by limited mobility is really any factor that is preventing an individual from getting to and from a vaccination site without assistance. Uh, and primarily it's financial assistance. So whether that be, um, you know, whatever that transportation medium is, uh, the, the costs associated with that transportation would be eligible under public assistance for any individual that would not otherwise be able to get to a vaccination site and home from the vaccination site without that transportation assistance. So that could be because of a disability or because of economic hardships or really any reason at all. And, the app, you know, and it's up to the applicant to uh, demonstrate why that transportation assistance was necessary. But, but when it is necessary, it's eligible for public assistance. Next slide. Um, On-site infection control measures. So a lot of this gets into what we were talking about with the safe opening and operations policy. So the disinfection and um, the barriers and all that. Uh, is eligible, um, but also on-site emergency medical care. So if someone has an adverse reaction to the vaccination or otherwise has some sort of emergency medical need that arises in the administration of the vaccine, um, those costs would also be eligible. Next slide. Uh, communications to disseminate public information. This is standard eligibility for public assistance. This is, but normally these are costs related to things like flyers and public service announcements and things like that to just get information about public health and safety out to the public related to that de declared event. Um, but for COVID-19, we're expanding that a little bit to also allow 
uh, things like call centers or websites um, when reasonable and necessary uh, in order to help support getting the information out to the public as well as providing a resource to the public to call in for information about the vaccine, whether that be general information or information about where to get a vaccine or how to register for a vaccine or even potentially to use that call center or that website to register people for the vaccine. And that really is up to the applicant to determine what their needs are, uh, but we are allowing those costs when reasonable and necessary. Uh, so training and technical assistance uh, specific to the vaccine. So again, this is for uh, individuals that are responsible for uh, storing, handling, or administering the vaccine that maybe uh, need some training or technical assistance specific to those kinds of COVID-19 vaccines. And then additionally, uh, so there are there are other medical type facilities that are typically funded through the Department of Health and Human Services. This includes federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, and critical access hospitals. These are all um, uh, supported by the Department of Health and Human Services. However, if vaccines are provided at those facilities and those costs are not covered by health and human services or any other funding source, it, those costs would be eligible under public assistance. Next slide. Um, so IT equipment and systems. So we initially, um, based on information from the Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC, we were expecting applicants to utilize their existing systems and processes uh, for managing their COVID-19 vaccination efforts. Uh, however, um, uh, identifying that some applicants may not have those capabilities, um, the CDC developed the Vaccine Administration Management System, which is free to any applicant, um, which to help uh, fill in some of those IT gaps that might exist. Um, in the event that an applicant identifies an IT need that is that is related to the vaccine efforts, that is not being properly met by their existing systems and processes, and is not being properly met by BAMs, um, additional costs to meet those IT needs would be eligible under public assistance. But again, that's really, you know, as a supplemental grant program that's intended to um, only provide that assistance when it's reasonable and necessary. Um, and so again, applicants are encouraged to use their existing systems when necessary. Uh, but if those existing systems and the VAM system set up by CDC are inadequate, um, then additional assistance under public assistance would be eligible. Next slide. Uh, and finally, uh, this is just sort of stressing points we've already made before. All of this eligibility that we're talking about uh, is, is subject to uh, the duplication of benefits requirements that we discussed earlier. So any cost that would be covered by another funding source, um, in particular to medical care, that would include um, patient billing, insurance, uh, private insurance, health insurance, um, that would include uh, billing to CMS, um, through the Department of Health and Human Services, which uh, are responsible for Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the Child Health Insurance Program, and those types of, any of those sources of funding for medical care um, would be considered a duplication of benefits, as well as any funding available from any other federal program, um, whether that be under one of the various COVID-19 appropriations, uh, or from any other grant program from another federal agency. Uh, all of those sources of funding are considered um, other sources of funding. And if those sources of funding are covering a cost, then that cost is not eligible for public assistance. Otherwise, uh, anything that we discussed here would be eligible for public assistance. Um, as stated too, uh, applicants are expected to follow their regular billing practices when they apply. And so what we mean by that is, um, if, a, if a governmental entity sets up a temporary facility, as an example, and that temporary facility does not have an established billing process, um, FEMA is not requiring applicants to set up a new billing process. So in those situations, we would not expect um, any of the services provided at those temporary facilities um, to be billed to insurance or to be billed to patients because those billing processes have not been set up. And in those cases, 
those costs would be eligible for public assistance. But if the billing practice, particularly at things like a hospital or any of those primary medical care facilities we discussed, if those billing processes are already in place, uh, FEMA expects the applicant to follow those billing processes and those costs uh, that would normally be covered under those billing processes would not be eligible for public assistance. However, any additional costs that are not covered uh, by another funding source uh, are eligible for public assistance. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so I don't know how much time we have built in for questions on this portion of the uh, presentation, but uh, Sarah and I will be happy to field those questions in the time that we're allotted. Thanks, KJ and Sarah. Yeah, we, we're a little bit uh, short on time, but we will begin our, our Q&A portion here real quickly. Just as a reminder, you can find these presentation slides to download in the Handouts tab of your GoToWebinar panel. Um, like I said, we are a little time constrained. I have a couple of pre-submitted questions here I will tee up, but if you don't have your question answered during this session, um, you can reach out to your FEMA regional point of contact, and you may also submit them in the question box today for the team, um, and they will be answered um, at a future time. Sarah, one question for you. Are all PA facilities eligible for reimbursement for safe opening and operating costs? Uh, in the interest of time, it may be safe to assume that Sarah is still experiencing technical difficulties, so I can field that question. Um, the simple answer is yes. Any public assistance applicant that would normally be eligible under the public assistance grant program is eligible under the safe opening and operations policy. And since COVID-19 declarations are across the board, I mean, every municipality, every county, every state, every territory is covered under the COVID-19 declarations. Um, that means that policy is applicable to literally any and all eligible PA applicants and their eligible facilities. Thanks, KJ. One more for you. Um, what does FEMA consider, quote, an acceptable projected need? And what is, quote, the reasonable limit? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, Sarah, are you available? Maybe you're more familiar with this question. Okay, that's okay. I can move on oh, to one more question. I, I can take a quick stab at it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay, great. So KJ, I can take this um, as long as my, uh, my audio function is now working. I apologize, everyone. Uh, someone was bound to have technical difficulties on one of these webinars. Um, so what we're asking for, for the safe opening and operating costs for when uh, applicants are going out and um, gathering supplies, say PPE, PPE face masks, um, or other surprises, is just to look at, make reasonable planning assumptions. Um, there won't be one straightforward answer for all of these. It'll depend on uh, the type of facility being operated and the manner in which it's operating. And so if you say a school um, is planning on doing, you know, the one one time use disposable face masks, you know, looking at how many students you have, how many faculty and staff, um, what, how many days you're in, in school, and then just planning out that way. Because the um, period of eligibility ends at September 30th, there is kind of that timestamp where applicants should have a pretty good idea of what they're gonna need, um, and, then, and then go out and um, procure those materials. So um, short answer is, is it depends, but I think as long as there is um, you know, some sort of a reasonable planning um, decisions being made, then and you can demonstrate that to FEMA that would be enough to show uh, that uh, you know that you would looked at your projected needs and then procured your uh, supplies accordingly. Terrific thank you both so much for that the presentation and, and the responses to these questions in the interest of time I'm going to turn to our next speakers but let me just remind participants if you have a question that was not answered today um, please either put it in the chat box um, for our team to take on, or um, please also remember you can reach out to your FEMA regional um, point of contact if you have um, additional questions. I will now turn to Leslie Sacedo from the Office of Equal Rights to provide an introduction to the equity portion of the webinar. Leslie? 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie Saucedo, and it is, uh, and I serve as the director of the External Civil Rights Division within FEMA's Office of Equal Rights. FEMA is really happy to provide this presentation on the medical care policies equity requirements, and the Office of Equal Rights is really proud of the opportunity to partner with public assistance in this important program and focus. This afternoon, we're gonna walk you through some of the underlying executive orders and laws, as well as the specific equity requirements. Our hope is to provide valuable information as you navigate the process. And of course, FEMA remains available and ready to assist. Next slide, please. So on January the 21st, uh, President Biden issued an executive order on ensuring an equitable pandemic response and recovery. Uh, the executive order established a directive to all state, local, tribal, and territorial governments to focus the use of FEMA funding on the highest risk and hardest hit communities and underserved populations. The EEO built on decades of civil rights laws and regulations that have always been a part of federal grants but it also highlighted the moral obligation we all share to ensure that we're reaching those that need our help the most. We know that every community is diverse with varying needs and resources, and FEMA wants to ensure that we're addressing and enhancing accessibility so that everyone wants a, who wants a vaccine can get one. Our objective is to ensure equity in the COVID-19 response and recovery, and FEMA's requirements and review processes are designed to identify potential issues early work collaboratively to address them and ensure accountability. Next slide, please. So we know that the prior and underlying civil rights laws and executive orders are numerous. Most commonly known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VI prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin in any program or activity that receives federal funds or other federal financial assistance. In addition, the Stafford Act requires non-discrimination in the delivery of disaster-related programs and activities by FEMA and recipients of FEMA financial assistance on the basis of race, color, religion, nationality, sex, age, disability, English proficiency, and economic status. And numerous other laws and executive orders focus explicitly on non-discrimination and equity based on age, disability status, limited English proficiency, and of course, the response to COVID-19. Next slide, please. As we know, COVID-19 has had a disproportionate effect on communities of color and other underserved populations, including sexual and gender minority groups, those living with disabilities, and those living at the margins of our economy. Executive Order 13995, ensuring an equitable pandemic response and recovery, was issued to ensure that the response to the pandemic is equitable and focused on those communities. Specifically, it directs governments to prioritize limited resources, including vaccines, and accomplish the vaccination mission in an equitable and impartial manner without discrimination. These requirements are not new. Civil rights requirements have always been a part of FEMA and recipient obligations, including the impartial and equitable delivery of disaster services. FEMA's focus on equity and vaccine administration is foremost focused on technical advice and guidance to ensure accessibility and the prioritization of the communities and all individuals within the communities that we know are most affected. Next slide, please. So to assist recipients evaluate their own compliance and to ensure they're conducted, conducting COVID-19 response and recovery efforts in an equitable manner, FEMA issued a civil rights considerations during COVID-19 vaccine distribution efforts checklist. That was not. To raise awareness of civil rights and equity concerns and for use in planning and implementing strategies. The checklist is a guide to ensure recipients are considering planning for and removing accessibility barriers. In addition, FEMA also issued a civil rights data collection advisory reminding recipients of their responsibility to collect and, when requested, submit demographic data to ensure compliance with civil rights. Both of these documents are available on the FEMA.gov vaccine support page. In addition, as a reminder, recipients and subrecipients have a requirement to submit the Department of Homeland Security's Civil Rights Evaluation Tool, which 
sets forth the civil rights and non-discrimination requirements I discussed earlier. It's now my honor to pass it over to Julia Molina to discuss the specific requirements of the program. Great, thanks, Gina. Uh, and appreciate the opportunity to, Gina, I'm sorry, Leslie, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, on the next slide, uh, uh, so Leslie spoke a little bit to some of the general uh, equity provisions that are part of uh, part of both the opening and operating policy and the medical care policy that KJ and Sarah presented on a few minutes ago. Um, I want to spend a few minutes calling out some specific requirements related to recipients and subrecipients of public assistance funding for vaccine administration. So the medical care policy uh, that we went over a little while ago um, includes two specific requirements that are, are relatively new to public assistance. The first is that recipients and subrecipients of FEMA assistance uh, for vaccine related activities shall collect data on race, ethnicity and disability status. Um, one thing to point out here, uh, this is a requirement uh, for data collection. However, FEMA will not request and recipients and subrecipients should not submit uh, personally identifiable information. So this is a requirement that recipients and subrecipients collect, but not submit personally identifiable information to FEMA. Uh, the second part of the requirement is that recipients and subrecipients must submit information every 30 days for ongoing vaccine administration work. And we'll talk about the specifics of what this is, but specifically, uh, the social vulnerability index or similar index score for each vaccination site, a description of how the location of each site best advances FEMA's focus on supporting the highest risk communities, and a strategy to operationalize equitable access at each site. So we'll spend a few minutes on each of those requirements, but before we do, uh, on the next slide, uh, we'll talk about uh, what the specific reporting requirements are. So there are, there are two factors that impact uh, what reporting requirements are for any entity receiving public assistance for vaccine administration. So one factor is the status of your vaccination work, and the other factor is the status of your project application and FEMA funding. Uh, so for the first factor, vaccine, the status of your vaccination work, uh, if all of your vaccination work is complete at the time that you're applying for public assistance, um, then you are required to submit a single uh, submission uh, summarizing how equity was considered as part of your overall vaccine uh, administration efforts. Um, so that is if all of your vaccination is, is work is complete at the time that you apply uh, for public assistance. Um, I, I don't think that there is any entity in America that currently meets that requirement. I think for the most part, um, entities have ongoing vaccination work. Um, and if your vaccination work is ongoing at the time that you, uh, uh, you come to FEMA for assistance, uh, then you, uh, you are required to uh, have an initial submission and then update that submission every 30 days. So the first major distinction is if all of your vaccination work is complete, you have one submission. If your vaccination work is ongoing, then you have a first submission and updates every 30 days until all of your vaccination work is complete. Um, and one thing just to point out, particularly for um, any entities out there that may be experienced public assistance applicants, um, the, uh, when we talk about the status of your vaccination work, we're talking about all of your vaccination work not necessarily the status of any individual uh, project application that comes to FEMA. So you may, you may have uh, work that you come to FEMA for reimbursement uh, for work that was completed a few months ago, but your overall vaccination mission is ongoing. Um, therefore, uh, we would consider your vaccination work, your overall vaccination work to not yet be complete. The second factor that impacts your information requirements is the status of your project application and your funding from FEMA. Um, so if uh, FEMA has already obligated funding for vaccination work, meaning you have already received public assistance funding for vaccination, then your first information submission was due, uh, I'm sorry, if FEMA had already obligated funding at the time the medical care policy was issued, then your first information submission was due uh, a couple weeks ago, was due on uh, April 14th, um, which was 30 days from the issuance of the medical care policy. 
Um, if uh, you have not yet, if you have applied for public assistance funding, but FEMA has not yet obligated funding, then your first information submission is due within 30 days of that initial obligation. So if you had funding obligated shortly after the policy was issued, or if you had already applied for funding and your application was in process, then your first submission is due within 30 days of that initial obligation. And then finally, if you have not yet applied for public assistance, um, then the, the timing of your information requirement varies depending on the status of your vaccination work. So if all of your vaccination work is complete at the time you're coming to FEMA for assistance, then your first information, your first and only information submission is due as part of your application package. It is due prior to receiving FEMA funding. If your vaccination work is not yet complete at the time you come to FEMA, then your first submission is due within 30 days of obligation with updates every 30 days until, uh, until the work is complete. Um, this information, um, as well as all of the other information that we're about to go through, is included in uh, the equitable COVID-19 response and recovery job aid um, that is specifically geared towards recipients and subrecipients of public assistance funding for COVID. Um, so this information is spelled out there uh, and uh, we'll uh, continue to refer back to it over the course of this webinar. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what the specific information requirements are. Uh, so the first requirement is social vulnerability scores for every site. Uh, this can be a CDC social vulnerability index. It can be a different uh, score that, that assesses the vulnerability of a particular jurisdiction. Um, but the idea is to have an assessment at every site of social vulnerability. One thing I will call attention to here, uh, it, uh, I, it is uh, likely true that there is not, uh, that I know that the CDC social vulnerability index does not necessarily include data at the tribal nation level. Um, and it may not be the case that there is another similar score at the tribal nation level. Um, if there isn't available information, it is acceptable to include in your submission that social vulnerability uh, information and index scores are not available uh, for that particular tribal nation. So I did just want to call that out as we recognize that there is not necessarily um, the level of uh, social vulnerability index and scoring um, available for every tribal entity. Um, that said, there likely are some instances where there is some assessment of, uh, of vulnerability uh, or other considerations. Um, so I would encourage you um, to consider whether there are other, other indices or other ways you can assess the, the you know, particular aspects that affect your entity. Um, in addition to the social vulnerability scores, we are looking for a vaccine administration strategy that covers five components. So um, uh, how you're uh, conducting outreach and engagement, um, your registration process, your vaccine site selection approach, your site accessibility approach, and evaluation and continuous improvement. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what each of those things might entail. Um, and I want to be really explicit here, and you'll, you'll see this on the slide and also in the job aid that I referenced. Um, what we have listed on the slide is, that, is what some of your considerations may include. And the reason that we have it framed that way uh, is that we want to be really careful to enable the flexibility for every recipient and every subrecipient to address the specific aspects of equity that are specific to your jurisdiction and your legal responsibility, because they are not the same from every entity to, to from every jurisdiction to every jurisdiction. Um, so I'll talk through some potential considerations here, um, but really want to emphasize that what we're looking for is that you are that you are following the process to consider equity, but that that process is really specific to the the particular considerations around vulnerability that affect your jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, the first component is outreach and, and engagement, excuse me. Um, so you may consider here how you're engaging with community leaders and community-based organizations. 
You may consider how your events are accessible to individuals with disabilities or limited English proficiency. Um, you're, uh, if you're a tribal entity who has a large number of um, uh, of uh, tribal members who do not live on your particular reservation, you may consider how your outreach and engagement strategy will reach uh, tribal members who live elsewhere. Um, you, uh, for the registration process component, um, you can address how your registration process is prioritizing minoritized, marginalized, or otherwise disadvantaged groups. Um, you might address how you are providing support to enable uh, enable uh, residents to meet scheduled appointments, uh, citizens to meet scheduled appointments. Your vaccine site selection strategy uh, might include consideration of how you are identifying populations with socioeconomic status barriers, individuals with physical disabilities, minority status, limited English proficiency, um, you may also consider housing and transportation barriers in your vaccine site selection strategy. Uh, your site accessibility approach may include a discussion of access for individuals with disabilities um, or limited English proficiency at each uh, vaccine site. It may include some a discussion of assistive technology uh, or accessibility by transportation to that particular site. And finally, your evaluation and continuous improvement approach might include a description of what approach you're taking to evaluate equitable vaccine administration and also uh, any tactical adjustments you might be making to improve equity in your vaccine administration approach. Um, so those are some considerations you might include um, as part of your as part of your uh, site administration strategy. Uh, next slide please. Um, so uh, the equity job aid uh, that I've mentioned includes a couple of templates, a template for your uh, equitable site administration strategy uh, that's also uploaded um, as an attachment to this, uh, um, this webinar. Uh, you are welcome to use that template, but you are not, uh, not required to. You can use your own template, you can use a report or a, a plan that you've developed for your own purposes or for the purposes of another uh, federal agency or program. Um, and, and we ask that you upload your vaccine information submission to your applicant profile in the public assistance grants portal. If you have applied for public assistance in the past, then you'll be familiar with the grants portal and you can upload that information through the, the uh, your uh, event profile. We are making enhancements to grants portal to make it a little bit easier and clearer to see uh, where exactly you need to upload your information and to make sure that you get reminders if and when you have submissions come due. Um, and as a reminder, if you have ongoing vaccine administration work, uh, your submissions must be updated monthly uh, for as long as your vaccine related work is ongoing. Next slide, please. Uh, so great, we have, uh, you've uh, developed your information submission, you've uploaded it to Grants Portal, now what happens? Um, so FEMA will uh, review all vaccine information submissions to ensure that one, the submissions are on time, two, the submissions are complete, and three, the vaccine strategies provided comply with civil rights laws and lead to equitable outcomes. Um, if you are a recipient and have subrecipients, uh, we strongly encourage that you review subrecipient information submissions um, and identify where and how a subrecipient's narrative approach or, or submission approach fits into yours. Next slide, please. Um, and so, uh, great. So then what happens if uh, we are missing an information submission or information is incomplete? So if we don't receive a, administ a vaccine administration strategy or if, if the information we receive is in incomplete, FEMA will issue a request for information uh, requesting the specific missing information, um, whether, whether that's the entire submission or a component of it, um, and recipients and subrecipients will have seven days to respond to that RFI. If we don't receive a response by the RFI deadline, uh, we will deny or deobligate funding. Um, that is not our goal. That is not what we're, we're aiming towards, but we, uh, it is critically important that we are uh, maintaining mutual awareness and accountability on, um, per, on equity in the provision of vaccine administration. And so uh, we do require that information uh, be submitted uh, and be complete 
on time. On the next slide, uh, I'll turn it over to Leslie to talk about what happens if FEMA identifies potential areas of concern. Thanks, Julia. So FEMA is really focused on identifying those areas and if found to understand the underlying reasons and provide some technical advice and recommendations to resolve those identified concerns. So for example, if a submission doesn't address or reference a specific group, um, whether it's individuals with disabilities or another at-risk population, we may mark it and uh, come back to you and provide some advice and guidance on how do you how to ensure that all individuals within your communities are able to get a vaccine if they want one. The goal is to ensure and enhance equity efforts through informal resolution, through conversations, uh, which are ongoing. And we really want to stress again that we are in the midst of this mission and it's not too late to enhance equity and to address those concerns. I also want to note that completely independent of the public assistance process, FEMA's Office of Equal Rights is responsible independently, right, for enforcing and ensuring compliance with civil rights. If concerns are unable to be resolved in any process, including the public assistance process, FEMA's Office of Equal Rights has regulatory processes and procedures to undertake civil rights compliance reviews and to resolve issues. However, the focus within the public assistance process and within the civil rights process are the same. First and always on resolution. So let me hand it over to Julia to talk about what happens if we can't meet resolution. Great, uh, thanks Leslie. So uh, the, uh, in the, the instances where we have identified potential areas for improvement, um, those, improve, those areas are either actions are either not taken or they are insufficient to reach equitable outcomes. Um, FEMA will implement uh, remedies under our authorities under 2 CFR um, that may include requiring that uh, payments are issued as reimbursements rather than advance payments, withholding the authority to proceed to the next phase of operations, or requiring additional reports or project monitoring. If those remedies are insufficient to accomplish the outcome, uh, we may implement further remedies uh, also under our two CFR authorities that may include temporarily withholding payments, denying or de-obligating funding, or uh, potentially suspending or terminating the award. Um, so I will mention that we, uh, we have under two CFR escalating, uh, escalating remedies uh, in the event that we identify potential areas of non-compliance, but I'll emphasize what Leslie said. It is our goal to uh, accomplish equitable outcomes in vaccine administration. And so our number one objective is to, if we identify a potential area to, of, for improvement, to work with the recipient, to work with the subrecipient, to make uh, course corrections and to ensure that uh, vaccine administration is equitable. Um, we will pursue the remedies that are on the screen um, if we absolutely must, but that is not our goal. Our goal is to work together to achieve equitable outcomes. Uh, so on the next slide, I'll kick it back to Leslie to talk up through a few tips and best practices. Great. Thanks, Anne, Julia. So FEMA wanted to make sure we provided some best tips and practices uh, that we have gleaned from our federal, state, tribal, and territor territorial partners, as well as that we learned ourselves by our own CVC or Community Vaccination Center pilot site planning and operations. The strongest suggestion we have is to work with your local health departments and community organizations who know your area, community, resources, and needs the best. They can help identify concerns, including specific groups or populations requiring assistance and suggest and implement responses. FEMA has had the privilege of reviewing a number of engagement and equity plans during our vaccine administration mission, and we really strongly suggest leveraging those existing plans and strategies. They're sound and directly in line with our checklist and our expectations. And of course, if you have questions or if you need assistance, please rely on your local equity task forces, civil rights offices, community and civil rights organizations, and FEMA. We are here to assist. So next slide, please. Finally, we wanted to provide you with a few resources. The first is the Equitable COVID-19 Response and Recovery Recipient and Subrecipient Job Aid, which we referenced numerous times during this webinar. Uh, it reviews the process we went through, as well as the items that FEMA is gonna be looking for and evaluating. In addition, the DHS Civil Rights Evaluation Tool 
contains recipient civil rights requirements. And finally, as we've discussed, FEMA issued uh, a checklist officially titled the Civil Rights Consideration During COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution Efforts. Um, all of those uh, can be found on our vaccine support page on FEMA.gov. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to uh, hand it back over to Julia or our, uh, our wonderful moderator to yeah, I gotcha. Uh, this is Lisa. Julia and Leslie, thank you so much. Great presentation, a lot of content, a lot of great materials. We are time limited, so I'm gonna start with a question from the chat. Um, so thank you for, for the question. On April 1st, 2021, Assistant Administrator Keith Torrey commented to tribal leaders that, quote, all tribal entities interested in public assistance will be provided with a program delivery manager to help navigate the process, unquote. My question is, what will the scope of the program delivery managers assigned to tribal nations that request them for assistance, what will the scope of their um, assignments be, and what will they be able to help tribal leaders with related to these COVID-19 policies? Julia, can I toss that to you? Yes, thanks, Lisa. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so a uh, program delivery manager is, uh, is first and foremost a customer service representative uh, on behalf of the public assistance program. Uh, under traditional uh, PA program delivery, so outside of the context of COVID, um, it is our standard practice to assign program delivery managers to every public assistance applicant to uh, do a few things, to help navigate through each step of the public assistance application, application process, uh, to help catalog the extent of the, uh, the specific claims that an applicant may want to submit, um, and to uh, answer and, and sort of help uh, foster an understanding of some of the basic eligibility requirements uh, that, uh, that exist within the public assistance program. Um, because of the sort of unprecedented nature and scale of COVID, uh, we uh, have actually pivoted most of our operations towards direct application, meaning applicants are able to apply directly to FEMA for public assistance without having to rely on a program delivery manager to walk them through the process. Um, uh, but we have uh, assigned program delivery managers to certain applicants uh, as needed to help navigate the process or to help uh, walk through uh, particularly complex uh, assignments so, or uh, projects and claims. Um, so to that end, um, the commitment that Mr. Turi made is really to help ensure that tribal leaders who are interested in having that additional technical assistance um, have access to a program delivery manager to serve as a point of contact for FEMA public assistance to help understand what all of the steps are to get from I have uh, costs that I'd like to claim to, uh, you know, there is money available um, and uh, to help uh, navigate any questions or eligibility concerns uh, that may arise. Um, so that is, that's the scope of what a program delivery manager uh, will be able to do. Um, and, uh, and hopefully that will be uh, of help um, for tribal leaders who are, particularly those who are navigating public assistance for the first time. Thanks so much. I do have a pre-submitted question here. There are specific requirements and timeframes for vaccine-related actions. What do I need to do to demonstrate compliance with the general equity provision requiring that my organization or entity has focused the use of FEMA funding on the highest risk communities and underserved populations? Uh, that's a great question, Lisa. Uh, so um, I think that there are, I think Leslie spoke to this uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, I think that the best tool is the civil rights checklist that the Office of Equal Rights uh, has prepared uh, to uh, help recipients ask themselves the question, um, am I achieving equitable outcomes in provision of assistance? Um, in addition, the DHS uh, evaluation tool, the civil rights evaluation tool, which is a requirement of every, uh, every federal grant award, uh, excuse me, is also helpful to ensure that recipients are, uh, are taking the steps that they need to uh, comply with equity provisions. Leslie, anything to add? 
I would just remind folks of the timelines that are included and making sure that you submit timely submissions. And in addition, uh, really evaluating your own community. As every community is different and diverse, there is no specific list of requirements that we can provide. But what we ask you to do is to go through your own community and ensure that you have thought through the additional needs or resources required to ensure that everyone who wants a vaccine can get one. Thanks. Thank you both. Well, time for one last question. Again, if your question wasn't answered today, please feel free to reach out to your regional point of contact or to drop it in the chat box for our team to answer at a later date. Last question. Are the equity requirements retroactive? In other words, will FEMA take away money that's already been awarded on the basis of non-compliance with equity provisions? Leslie, could I ask you to take that one? Happy to take that one. Um, as, as we've mentioned several times, the goal of this program is not to deobligate or take away any financial awards. The goal of this program is to ensure compliance. So uh, we, as a focus, are focused on resolution. We're asking that you please provide information um, regarding your focus on equity so that we can evaluate it. And if we do find any areas of concern, then we're able to specifically address them. Uh, it is a, a last resort, I would say, for, for everyone um, to look at, at awards and, and, and consequences regarding them. Our focus and, and priority is on ensuring that we are able to provide vaccine administration in an equitable manner um, for everyone. Thank and you, Leslie and Julia, so much for your presentation and for these responses. I will now introduce Frank Matranga. He is the Deputy Director of FEMA's Public Assistance Division to provide closing remarks. Frank? Great. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you to everyone on the webinar um, for joining us here today. Uh, I know this was uh, a lot of information um, shared in a short amount of time when um, all of you and all of us have a significant amount of um, operational concerns going on um, with ensuring that we are vaccinating as much of our populations as we can. So uh, thank you a tremendous amount for joining us today. Um, hopefully we were able to answer a lot of your questions. Um, as Ms. Montero uh, stated earlier, uh, and it's important to reemphasize, and, and Leslie was just hitting on this um, right before this, um, FEMA is committing to, committed to working with you and moving forward uh, to ensure that we can address all of your questions. Um, we won't have the answer um, to everything, um, but we are absolutely committed um, to working with you hand in hand and making sure that you're getting the assistance you need to, to respond to the pandemic. Um, this is a critical point in our operations um, as uh, at the federal level, at the you know state, local and tribal levels, at all levels of, of government, these are this is a very critical point in our operations. Um, we have the opportunity uh, to ensure that collectively um, we're doing right by the people that are hit hardest by COVID. Um, and that's why we took the time here to meet with you today um, to talk a little bit about um, some expanded eligibility within the program and reimbursing um, activities you may be undertaking and, and really talking about how we're doing that um, in a way that um, you know meets our shared objective in equitable vaccination administration and equitable response to COVID-19. So I hope that the information and resources we shared uh, here with you today have been helpful. Um, they're, they're all available online on FEMA.gov and if you just look for the public assistance program um, in the search bar on FEMA.gov, you can you can find all these info all this information related to COVID-19. Um, if you have any additional questions, as was mentioned up top, you know, feel free to reach out to your FEMA tribal liaisons or regional points of contact with more specific questions. Um, again, you know, some of the nature of just applying to a grant program is some of these questions we aren't answerable in the abstract. Um, we've got to get you know into the grant application process and get that information from you guys to answer questions. So um, again, I can't thank you enough for being here um, and thank you for your continued efforts um, to support your communities and communities across the country um, as they, they face the pandemic. I think, um, you know, 
um, internal to FEMA, um, we had a conversation the other day and, and one of the great stories of the pandemic is what a wonderful job tribal communities are doing um, supporting non-tribal members um, in responding to the pandemic. And so um, I can't thank you enough for all of that work. I know you guys are, are going be above and beyond um, what's expected of you as, as, as we all need to right now to respond um, to the pandemic. So um, hopefully this is useful information about how PA can be a resource for you um, and ensuring that you can get uh, the financial assistance you need. So um, again, thank you uh, for attending today and, and more importantly, thank you for your continued efforts um, across the country as we support COVID-19. So have a good afternoon. And Thanks everyone, have a wonderful day.